an honor and a privilege to be here and uh, to, to be able to share with you. Um, just want to say this is, a, this is a fantastic church. And I've been uh, tracking with you. Yeah, fantastic church. I've been tracking with you unbeknownst to you for a number of years. And so as Pastor Josh mentioned, I, we, my wife and I, we uh, started a church in Waterdown called Community Church. And uh, during that season... Your former pastor here, uh, Jeff Johnson, him and I would play hockey together. Uh, We had a summer league and a winter league. And so we were together uh, each and every week we would play together. And and so uh, him and I were defense partners for a lot of that time. And and, uh, we would often get into conversations about our churches. And so I felt like I was tracking with your church for many, many years. And so it's kind of neat to be here uh, now on a Sunday. I want you to know as well, you have some of the finest pastors in our district. And so, yeah. Sometimes you don't know what you have, but I want you to know you have some of the best of the best of the best and some like absolute all-stars and uh, just want you to know, Pastor, Pastor Josh and Jordan are just like revered in our district as like all-stars and um, want you to know how great of pastors you have. Yeah, sometimes you don't, you don't know that. So I want you to just give you a little bit of, who am I? Who's this idea of the P- POC, if you don't know? So Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. And so we're a network of churches. What we call ourselves is actually a fellowship of churches. And we, I, I push back hard against uh, that we're not actually a denomination. Uh, the language is intentional, that we're a fellowship of churches. Uh, denomination means top down. Uh, fellowship means that we're a collective group of people together serving on mission. And really the reason that we came together as the POC is, is kind of twofold. Number one is, is we came together to do uh, global missions in a greater way. So we said together we can impact the world in a greater way. And so that was kind of the key reason actually in our formation is let, let's come together so that we can reach the world in a greater way. I see even from the slide at the beginning, you guys are doing an amazing job of, of serving so many uh, different organizations and different global workers. Uh, myself this week, I'm actually heading to Africa on Thursday this week and meeting with uh, a number of our global workers there and our Bible colleges there. And so uh, just going to be an excellent time together. The other reason that we came together as a fellowship is to do uh, multiplication, that we believe that we wanted to reach Canada in a greater way. And so so we came together to say, how can we partner together to, to support one another to reach uh, our nation in a greater way. And so, and we've seen God do that uh, as we, we've been together. So across Canada, there's some uh, 1,200 churches that, that would be part of this same movement across Canada, of the POC, 1,200 churches across Canada. And then we're divided up into eight different districts. And the district that you're part of, that I'm part of, is called the Western Ontario District. And so in the Western Ontario District, we have uh, right now, we have about 367 churches uh, as of this week. It's constantly changing. Uh, I want you to know that just even uh, uh, one month ago, we had two new starts. And so one in North York, and then we had closed a church in Dundas, and we restarted a new church in Dundas. And so, so excited to see what God's doing as those churches experience their first ever Sunday. You see on the slide, we have a number of First Nations churches that we're a part of. And I know that you guys have been generous towards some of those churches in past as well. And and I want you to continue just to be praying for our First Nations community. There's immense challenges there, like immense challenges uh, that it's just, uh, I had this summer, I was saying uh, uh, recently, I had one of our pastors call us and he said, Jay, I don't know what to do. I've done 17 suicide funerals this year. What do I say anymore? What do I do? These are intense challenges, intense challenges. 
this uh, by partnership, because we're in the partnership together. This summer, one of our communities was cut off, and because of COVID, they had challenges getting food and everything in. And, and so we were able to uh, commandeer this plane, and we were able to take, and we got uh, 1,500 pounds of food brought into this community that literally was starving. And uh, so it was kind of a cool thing. We're on the like front lines trying to figure out logistically how to do it and get these people in, and we had to get people with uh, the COVID protocols and everything. And so anyways, just want you to know that your partnership is actually making a difference uh, across, across our province. In a, in a significant way. And so thank you, Kingsview, for being a part of that. And thank you as we're, we're together trying to serve and make a difference here in our nation and in our province uh, for Jesus. I also want to bring greetings from my wife. Uh, Carla is her name. So she's on staff at a church in Barrie. So she's leading worship there this morning and she's part of things there. And, and so she sends greetings to you. She's been blessed by you guys as well. When we were starting community in Waterdown, you guys gave us like Easter cream eggs and all sorts of stuff, <laughs> like crazy, like skids of them. Uh, as, as she was uh, helping out with our kids ministry there, uh, you guys did an amazing job helping us. So thank you. So she sends thank yous to you uh, this morning. My son, Caleb, he's uh, just gone to university. He's out in Calgary. And my daughter, Grace, is in her third year of university at uh, Western in London. So we're officially empty nesters, which is crazy. Uh, but I'm a little, uh, we're, we've put away a few of the Kleenex boxes, but we're still uh, walking that road uh, this fall as we became empty nesters. My son sent me a picture, though, the other day, and he, on Friday, he's skiing at Lake Louise, and he's like, Dad, this is amazing out here. And I'm like, son, remember where you came from, you know? <laughs> but, uh, but his goal is actually to be a missionary doctor someday, so we'll see what the Lord would do through him. As I was thinking about what to share with this fine church and, and, and thinking about what direction the, the Lord would put on my heart for this morning and, and kind of where to go and, and, and how to share with you. You've just been on an incredible journey, this alpha journey, amazing, amazing uh, moments. And, and I just, I think they're so good to ask some of those questions, to, to wrestle through some of those things. And, and then as you were taking intentional time away yesterday, just to say, okay, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do in our lives? And, and I just think that's so, so key as you've made those priorities and, and thinking that through, okay, Lord, what, what do you want to do in us? How do you have the life and life to the full that your scripture talks about? The more life, if you will. See, God's word promises us that we are to have life and life to the full in John 10, 10. And so what does it mean to have, have that kind of more life uh, focus. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me uh, to 1 Kings chapter 19. And we read this story. It's, uh, it's an interesting story. So just to kind of set up what's happening. There's a guy by the name of Elijah, who's been the prophet, and he's been serving God and trying to do the things of God. Now, there's this evil king, his name's Ahab, and Ahab is trying his desperate to, uh, to destroy the works of God, to destroy actually the work of Elijah. And just, he's doing awful, awful things. In fact, he's got this wife Jezebel, which just sounds nefarious, doesn't it? Jezebel. Sorry if your name's Jezebel here. <laughs> and she is bent on destruction for Elijah. So much so that uh, God showed up and did incredible things, but... But he has these moments when he's like wrestling, like, is this, Lord, where are you in all of this? And the Lord speaks to Elijah, I want you to anoint somebody to be with you. I don't want you to be alone in this deal. Now, think about it for a second. The Lord's actually said that there's going to be a famine in the land. I don't know how many of you have ever experienced famine type things before, but, uh, but if you have, it's like, it, it's, it's, it's trouble. It's, it's been a pandemic season basically in this context of scripture for three years. Does anyone know what it feels like to have a pandemic for three years? It's been a tough season. And so here we pick this story up on the tail side. It's just coming out of 
a pandemic season. It's just coming out of a real rough time, just coming out of this season that's been really difficult, really challenging. And, and we, we, we find this story. It's just brought rains. It's, it's the first time, you know, farmers can get out on the land again after three years. And so we pick this story up. Here's this guy by the name of Elisha. Now, why does the Lord put Elisha and Elijah together? I think it's just to mess with preachers like forevermore uh, so that they get them mixed up all the time. But Elisha is out there and it says that he's, he's out plowing. And it says that he has 12 yoke of oxen. Now, for those of you, that doesn't mean probably anything. But in that day and age, he's like the mega farmer. You know, he's like the one with like the big articulating in the center tractors. Like he's like the big deal farmer. And it says that he's actually uh, plowing with the 12th pair. Like he's doing it himself. So, so the, he's, he's part of the action. Think about it for a second. Three years, he hasn't been able to have crops. Three years, it's been, been, been famine and drought. Finally, he's out on the land. Finally, he's doing what he's like been made for. Finally, he's out there with the hope of a new season. And as he begins to plow and as he's part of things, out from nowhere comes Elijah. Now know that Elijah is the most wanted in the whole land. Like there's a death warrant on his head. But he also is known like this guy knows the Lord. And so you can just imagine for a second, like imagine if you go to work tomorrow and like, Billy, well, Billy Graham would be a real surprise, but um, uh, like that kind of caliber of person just like shows up at your workplace. Like, it's like, whoa, what's going on here? And, and, and so here, Elisha is just like taken back and he puts a mantle on him, which for us, what does that mean? It, it means a cloak that, that kind of signified like an anointing, signified like God's hand on somebody. And so he puts this cloak on him and, and Elisha's like, whoa, wait, what, what am I doing? I got to go back. To, and Elijah's like, hey, no pressure, dude. Like you do whatever God's calling you to do. And so it says that he goes back and get this. It says he takes... Remember, he's been waiting three years for this moment. And it says that he takes his plowing equipment. He starts this giant bonfire. He slaughters. Now, if you're a vegan, sorry. He, he slaughters the animals and has this massive barbecue. And then it says that he follows Elijah and becomes his attendant. He drops everything and says, okay, God, I'm following you. This is a crazy story. Like, imagine the shift. Imagine the moment here. Like, just dropping everything and following what God has and, and becoming an attendant. And it says that through Elisha's life, God did more miracles than anybody else in Scripture next to Jesus. Isn't that crazy? Like, wild stuff from this guy that was just an everyday guy, just a farmer guy, and God used him. Listen to what it says in John 15, 16. It says, you do not choose me, but I have chosen you. In other words, God has chosen each and every one of us. And look what it says. It says he's chosen us to what? Bear much fruit. He's appointed us not to bear a little fruit. In other words, to not have a little impact, but your lives are calling. There's a calling on your lives to bear much fruit. Turn to the person beside you and say, much fruit. <laughs> that God has something incredible in store for your life. Listen to what it says in Ephesians uh, 4.1. It says, therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, this is Paul. He says, I beg you, I beg you, I beg you. Live a life worthy of your call. See, I think there's too many Christians that are just going through the motions and they're just doing like kind of life. And God's called us to live this life with, to the full, with everything in us. I beg you, live a life worthy of your call. Students, young people, tweens that are here, live a life worthy of what God's called you to. Do something with your life to say, okay, God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it all to you. John 10, 10, which I've been referencing, it says, the thief comes only to steal, lie, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you have life and life to the full. What does it mean to have life to the fullness, to, to live out what God would call for us? How, how do we live this kind of more life? How do we live out this journey of what God has in store? I, I want to give you four things. Uh, try and be quickly this morning. Uh, four things to live this out. Number one is if we're going to walk in this journey, be faithful where you're at. 
Think of this story for a second. Here's Elijah, or Elisha, and he's just out there, and he's just plowing. I can imagine that morning as he's having his breakfast, he's not thinking, okay, today's going to be the day that I'm going to leave everything and walk with the prophet Elijah. Like, that wasn't even on his radar. But God showed up. He wasn't sitting there waiting and saying, okay, well, I'm going to do something for God someday, so I'll just sit here and do nothing until somebody comes out of the bushes to anoint me. No, he's faithful. See, you got to understand in that day and age, if you had 12 yoke of oxen, you probably were someone normally that would just kind of put your feet up and relax and let others work for you. But, but no, he's out there like driving the 12th pair. I don't know how many of you, anyone here ever like actually plowed before? So I got a little bit of redneck roots to me and so uh, some farmer in me. And, and one of the things that we used to do at my grandpa's farm is every, every Thanksgiving, this sounds really farmerish to do, but uh, on Thanksgiving we would get together and, and we, would, we would have a plowing match at his farm. <laughs> and so it was like a competition to see who could plow the straightest and the best. And, and he would have these tractors, like he'd have an old, old tractor from like the 30s and, and actually one even earlier with like the steel wheels kind of thing. And then one from, you know, the 40s and 50s and all the way up to like the super, you know, massive horsepower, articulating the center, like huge tractor. But, but then he would pull out like the one furrow plow, like the, the horse drawn one. Now we didn't actually have a horse to pull it, but uh, they had horses around, but not one that was trained enough at that time to pull it. But we would pull it with like the four wheeler, the John Deere Gator thing. And, and I want to tell you, I'm someone in peak physical condition. <laughs> That's not the spot you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> but in my peak physical condition, I want to tell you, like, just doing one row in the field with that, it is like, wow, that is a solid, solid work effort there. Like, it is exhausting. Here's Elijah. Elisha's there just being faithful to God, like the hard work. Some of you are in a job and you're like, God, this is not what I anticipated for my life. God, I'm in a situation right now that, that I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see this going this direction. God, I, 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 it's not the way, panning out the way. And God would say, just wait. Be faithful and I'll show up. Be faithful and, and I'll do this incredible miracle. Just be faithful where you're at. Serve the Lord with the best that you have at, at this moment. And you never know, today could be the day that God shows up in incredible ways. Maybe you feel like you're under-resourced in your job, or maybe you feel like you, you're just kind of, no one notices you, and you're just kind of going through the motions. I want to encourage you, be faithful. You doing the Alpha thing yesterday was making me think, um, it was a couple years ago, I was with one of the pastors and he was telling me, he's, he's, just, he's, he's sharing with me about how he just, he, he feels like he, he was trying to do campus ministry at a university campus and, and he's like, oh, if I could just do Alpha. And he's like, I've, I've prayed and God just hasn't opened a door and I'm just trying to be faithful serving here at this school, but, but it just hasn't happened yet. And I said, well, let's, let's continue to pray. And he said, I just want to do Alpha for our students, but I just don't have a room. And, and with the school regulations, you have, to have, uh, you have to have staff that are unionized. And so then the bill is extremely expensive. He said, it just isn't possible. But, but I said, just be faithful. Let's just keep praying. And we're sitting in this coffee shop talking about it's actually a breakfast place. And the, this guy comes over to us and he said, listen, I can't help but overhear your conversation. He said, I've been eavesdropping on you for a while. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> kind of random. And then we're like, what is this guy going to say? And he said, so you're talking about this university and you're, uh, he said, I'm just moved as I'm sitting here. He said, actually, I give a lot of money to that university. He said, see the football stadium? He said, it has that name on it. That's my name. I was like, oh. And he said, I love what you're doing. He said, here's what's going to happen. He said, I'm going to cater the entire expense of Alpha. I'm going to give you the best room that the school has. And I'm going to pay the entire bill. And he said, don't worry about a thing. And God supplied. Isn't that cool? 
And so 95 university students within two weeks of that time were taking Alpha with a fully catered meal at the best room in the university. And so many people came to faith. Be faithful where you're at and God will just show up sometime. Be faithful to serve and be faithful to to slug it out, to do the hard work. Just be faithful where you're at and see what God will do. Number one, he was just faithful. He just did what God called him to do. Number two is be open. I think of this story and and I don't know if like Elisha was there. Just think about it for a minute. For three years when it was famine, like when those cows would have looked very tasty to eat, those oxen. Instead, he was using his resource to feed them and to keep them through this, this time. Like, what a challenge it would have been and, 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 and financially strapped and all these things. Now it's like, Lord, why are you showing up right now? I found the most intentional time God shows up in my life is often the times that are the least uh, the times that it's the least convenient in my life. Are you open to what God would do? Think about it for a second. It was a change of vocation. He could have said, listen, I'm a farmer. I don't know nothing about being a prophet. Like, I'm not trained in ministry. Like, this isn't my deal. He could have said, like, listen, I don't even know what the salary package is. Like, like this is it. But he went for it. Are you open to whatever God would want to do in your life? Like literally, are you open? I was, I was just chatting with somebody yesterday and they said, you know, I, we were talking about planting churches in downtown Toronto. And they said, well, you know what? I, I, I don't want to do that. And I said, oh, well, just pray about it. And I'm just kind of poking them a little bit. And they said, well, I don't want to pray about that one just in case God says yes. And I was like, <laughs> and I said, did you know that what God actually has for you is the very, very best for your life? And God would never take you on a journey that isn't the best for your life. And sometimes the most inconvenient moments are when God will show up. Sometimes the the moments that just feel like, wow, God, are you sure this time right now is actually the very moment God wants to do the greatest work in your life. A few years ago, I was... um, I was dealing with a church that was going through some challenge. One of my roles is I get to serve uh, the pastors of churches. And and most times, 99% of the time, it's really great. But then occasionally there's issues. We're people, right? And so this church was having some conflict. And and I had a Sunday booked off. And I was looking forward to this Sunday off. I I was doing a wedding in Niagara-on-the-Lake on the Saturday. And so it was like beautiful in Niagara on the lake. And, and so during the week the, there's like, it's ratcheting up a notch and I'm like, oh, it's getting out of control there. And my wife's like, you know, you need to go. And I'm like, no, I don't, no, I don't. Blah, blah, blah. And, and, and she's like, no, you really need to go. And, and so Saturday, Carla and I are together at this wedding and she's like, Jay, you really need to go. And the texts are going back and forth and it's just getting out of control. And, and I'm like, no, I'm not going to go. No, I'm not going to go. And she's like, She's a little wiser than me. She's like, yes, I think you should go. And so finally I'm like, okay. And it was a church way in Northern Ontario. And so I, had to, I couldn't get flights up. So I, had to end up, I was driving through the night, literally through the night. And the whole time I'm just cranky. You know, I'm like, rah, rah, rah. I was expecting to have this time off. And I was just, I was just angry and cranky. And, and I get up to the church and I probably had a little edge to me when I was preaching that morning. And, and, and you know, I'm a little cranky, but, but the, God did this miracle and there was a healing moment and, and we met together with leadership after. It was just a beautiful moment, but I still was just kind of cranky. Like, you guys are so immature, you should have been able to figure this out, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so anyways, I'm driving home after and, and I get in my car and, and it's a long stretch. Like, Northern Ontario is big. Just to give you an idea, our district is so geographically diverse. If I got in my car from Kingsview and I went to our Morse Northern Church road-wise, that's not even including the fly-in ones, it's about the same distance from here to our most northern church as it is to Disney World if I got in my car and drove south from here. Just again, to give you a geographical idea, it's huge. And so I'm driving along, and you know when you see those signs that say, like, last gas for 300 kilometers, like that, they mean it. And, and so 
I'm driving along, there's nothing there, and all of a sudden my car starts to make this really weird noise. And it's like, you know, click, 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 click. And, and I'm like, hmm, that's not good. And, but you're up there, and I'm like, what am I going to do? So I just turn the radio up and keep driving. And, <laughs> and so generally speaking, noises in cars don't go away on their own. And so it got louder and louder and louder, and I just turned the radio up louder. And I was telling the Lord how, how badly I, you know, I shouldn't have been having to do this and yada, yada, yada. And, and all of a sudden, flames start shooting out of my hood. And I'm like, uh-oh, this is not good. So I pull over to the side of the road, and I had some water bottles. I'm putting it on. I put my coat on there and, and, and got the fire out. But now I'm in the middle of absolute nowhere, and my car is melted. And I'm like, and I, I'm like oh, Lord. So I look, and no cell reception, but I'm kind of in a semi-mountainous zone. So I literally, I'm climbing this mountain in the middle of nowhere, trying to get service. And like, you know, you get the one bar finally. And I, I call CAA and, and they're like, okay, we'll be there in a half hour. And I was like, oh, that's really good. Like, unbelievably good. And I hang up and I'm excited. And then in a few minutes later, they call me back. Sorry, sir, we didn't realize where you are. It's going to be eight hours. And I'm like, oh, perfect. So there I am on the side of the road for eight hours. It's hot. The bugs are atrocious. I don't have any water anymore because I poured it all on my burning car. And, I, and I'm sitting there and I'm just like, just angry, you know? God, why did you make me do this? Tow truck driver comes along. He's got one of those flatbed ones. And and so we put the vehicle on there, and, and he's like, okay, it's, it's 300 kilometers to the next service station. You're riding with me for a while. And so he said, unfortunately, he said, my seat broke, uh, the passenger seat. So he's like, I got a cooler that you got to sit on. <laughs> Perfect. So there I am sitting in a cooler for 300 kilometers in the middle of nowhere, and I'm just kind of cranky. And, and so he's trying to make small talk with me. He's a big t tow truck driver. And he's like looking at me. And I'm like, <sighs> you know, just like, I'm just in a bad mood. And so after a while, he's talking to me. And then he's like, so what do you do? Uh, and I said, I work with people. <laughs> and so then he's pressing. And, and so then he's like, so what do you really do? Oh, I'm a pastor. Oh, he said, I thought pastors might not be so cranky. <laughs> and so he said, actually, he said, I'm so glad that you're here. And he began to share a little bit. And he said, I've been hoping to meet a pastor for a long time. Big, tough tow truck driver. He's like tatted up, like stereotypical, you know? And he begins to share his story with me. And I finally get it. Like the Lord had me the whole time on mission for this guy. And I didn't get it, you know? As I began to finally share the love of Jesus with him and came out of my crankiness and whininess, tears are streaming down his face and able to lead him to Jesus that day. But I almost missed it. And see, the thing is, so many times I almost miss it. And so many times I do miss it. And, and if I was just a little more open, okay, Lord, sometimes in the inconveniences, sometimes in those moments, God, that's actually when you want to use me the most and get my attention. Here, Elisha, plowing for the first time three years. Okay, it's going to be a great day. And the Lord says, now's the time. And maybe over your life, you've been saying to the Lord for too long, Lord, it's not the time, it's not the time. Well, my kids are young right now, maybe when they're a little uh, less of a handful. Lord, it's not the time. You know my job right now. It's just, it's not the time, Lord. Lord, just, uh, just give me a little later. And Lord, it's not convenient right now. And God says, be open, be open, be open. Be faithful, number one. Be open, number two. And just see what God will do. And then number three, go courageously all in. I love this scene because it's, it, you know, if it's me, I'll, I'll be like, okay, Elijah, I'll go follow you for a little bit, but I'll have this back there. And so if it doesn't work out, you know, we got a plan B. And I love plan Bs, but sometimes the Lord's like, no, push all the chips into the center. 
I want you to go for it. And see, the problem is if you have a plan B, when the going gets tough, you'll always take the plan B. And some of you are, aren't sure why, like, my journey with God is not, it's just, I'm frustrated. I'm not, I don't seem fulfilled. And it's because you got one foot in and one foot out the whole time. And God's like, no. He goes and burns the plowing equipment. He has a barbecue with the oxen. There is no going back. Are you all in with what God has for you? Like, are you full tilt in on the journey God has for your life? I remember when I felt called to ministry. I, I remember when God kind of put on my heart, like, this is what I was supposed to do with my life. And I was in a service kind of like this. And, and the, there was a preacher talking. And, and I felt like this big boom, 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 boom in my heart. Like, I was feeling called to what God had for me. And, and, but I remember thinking, I don't want to pastor. That seems so boring. Like, I just felt like every pastor I knew was boring. And I was like, I don't know. I remember having this conversation with God. You ever have those where I'm like, okay, Lord, I'll serve you if you promise to. Be really careful with those. I remember saying, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll give my whole life. I'll go full all in if you promise it won't be boring. The Lord's had a funny way of reminding me of that every once in a while. My wife and I were smuggling Bibles into China and we got arrested and guys with machine guns pointed at us. This is back in the 90s and, and we're in this room like just like a movie, like a light on us and they're questioning us and I remember my wife leans over and is like, are you bored yet? <laughs> I was yesterday in a board meeting for some Haitian ministry stuff that we're doing. And, and I was reminded I was in Haiti a few years ago and, and we're speaking at this church, but we went to go and the bridge was out and they're like, can you still make it? And, and I'm like, okay, well, I'll do whatever. And they're like, okay, well, you have to ford across this river, but it's at flood stages. So there's a rope, you hold onto the rope and you kind of journey yourself along across through the river. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like ha barely hanging on. And, and, and the guy behind me, and I have this actually older lady that is car I'm carrying to get there to, and, and the guy behind me is like, are you bored yet? And I was like, hmm, nope, Lord. Go all in for the things of God. I guarantee you the journey will be like the best ever. If you asked Elisha, like he had a pretty stable, like he was set after the famine, he was set to really make bank. Like he had preserved these animals. He was going to be the farmer of the, of the region. Like he was going to make money. But he chose to say, okay, God, I'm going to follow you. Students, I want to tell you the life lived for God so good. Like if you follow after what God has for your life, it will be the most exciting life you can ever imagine. It'll just be so, so good. I use this illustration all the time, but, but, but you know, when, when I go on a trip, you know where I don't go on my motorcycle? I, I like riding motorcycles. Anyone like riding motorcycles? I used to ride with Jeff Johnson from <laughs> this church all the time too. And you know where I don't go on my motorcycle? I don't go to Windsor. If you've ever been to Windsor, it's like the most boring, straight, flat road known to mankind. They actually have large signs on the road that say, fatigue kills, take a break. They built the road knowing it was so boring, we have to put up signs to have people stay awake. Like that's how boring this road is. But see, when I get on my motorcycle, there's this road over by Waterdown, Snake Road. And it's a phenomenal road. If you haven't taken it, take that road. And up and down the escarpment over here, there's these incredible roads that are just like, you know, it, you got to kind of white knuckle a little bit around the corners. It's amazing. Some of you have said, Lord, 
I want the road of my life to be straight, flat, easy. And then you wonder why you're falling asleep and unfulfilled. You wonder why you're just like, hey, this isn't making it. But the journey God has for us, oh, there's going to be some sweeping moments. There's going to be some great highs. There's going to be some moments where you're like, white knuckle, hang on, like it's going to be a ride. But I want to tell you, it's worth it every time. Be faithful. Be faithful with what you're at. Go all in. Be open. And then finally, walk humbly. This one doesn't kind of go with the other ones a little bit, but I think it's actually the gateway for God doing incredible miracles through our lives. See, so many of us want to serve God, but in an advisory capacity only. And God's looking for people that are our servants that will do whatever he's calling them to do. Think about it for a minute. This guy was a, he was, he was like the boss man. He was in charge of a big operation and he leaves it all what? To become the attendant of Elijah. In fact, scripture says that he was the guy who poured water on his hands. Like, not a big high level job, so to speak, to begin but it was the conduit and the vehicle for God training him to do incredible things through him. See, I've found every time God wants to open a new door over my life, there's always a doorway of humility I gotta walk through. There's always a moment of saying, okay, God, I just, I gotta trust you, God, and I just, I gotta, I gotta become the servant of many. See, our world says the higher you go, the more people will serve you. And the way that God's economy works is the higher you go, the more people you serve. It's very different. I've told this story a ton of times, but I think it's just... When I first got into ministry, my very first job, my very first day as a pastor, I was the assistant to the assistant youth pastor at Evangel Church in Brantford. And in church world, that means the lowest person on the ladder. And I remember showing up and I, I didn't have a real office. They had the choir room, it's old school. They had a choir room with like the robes for the choir people. And, and, and so they carved out a little space in that room for me. They put a little brass nameplate on the door, said Pastor Jason. And I remember like sitting in there. I didn't, I had like no books or anything. I had one like large study Bible that I kind of tried to position on the desk like, like it was important. And I remember I was sitting there. I'm like, I'm a pastor now. And on my very first day, I, my first phone call in, it was like one of those phones that had lots of different like uh, extensions and whatever. I didn't even know how to run it. And, and so the phone rings and I'm trying to figure out how to answer it. And I answered it in my best like Southern Baptist preacher voice. Pastor Jason here, you know. And it was the senior pastor, his name is Bruce Schwint, and he's like, Jay, I need your help. There was an explosion in the girls' bathroom. I don't know what happened. I don't know what they ate. I don't know what went on. It's a mess. You got to fix it. My very, very, very first job as a pastor was fixing the toilet in the girls' bathroom, which was nasty. <laughs> Fast forward the story. I go to Bible college, we finish, and, and my wife and I go to move to Hong Kong, and, and we're missionaries now, you know, yay, and so we're excited. We, we, we become missionaries, and we move into uh, this uh, amazing spot in and, and, uh, Mung College, and, and so it's seven floors, no elevator, it's 40 degrees, full humidity, it's hot, 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 take all our stuff up, we get unpacked, and, and they're like, oh, um, Mr. Jason, um, one problem. They said, your bathroom in your, in your flat, uh, the toilet's not working. Do you know how to fix a toilet? And I'm like, yeah, I think so. So it's 40 degrees, full humidity. My first job as a missionary is <laughs> fixing a toilet. Fast forward the story a little bit. I moved to Inglehart, Northern Ontario, little small church and 
kind of just on Highway 11 in the north. It's uh, kind of between uh, North Bay and Timmins, if you know that area. And so little community. And, and my wife and I are pastors, and we move in. I got lots more books on the shelf now. And we move in excited. I'm senior pastor now. Like, this is going to be great. So excited to be a senior pastor. And, and we're, 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 we're pumped at this opportunity. And guess what happens on my first day? The toilet did not break, but the urinal did. And it was disgusting. And there I am. The guy's like, he's like, there's some mess in the guy's bathroom. And I'm, oh, and, and we fix it. Fast forward the story again. We leave there to go be church planters. We're church planters now. I don't even have a building for a toilet to break. We had nothing. But uh, I called our district office and I w was looking for some office space. So I asked if I could rent just a little cubicle. So I had a tiny little cubicle and we we're planting this church in water down. We're so pumped, you know, we're excited. And so I'm working in my little cubicle. We're working on community church stuff, getting excited. And my very first day there, Ken Raymer, he's the secretary of treasurer. Ken comes down. Ken says, hey, Jay, your dad had a hardware store, didn't he? I said, yeah, he did actually. He's like, do you know anything about fixing toilets? I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> and there I am fixing a toilet on my very first day. You can't make this stuff up. Fast forward the story one more time. So I move to become the Northern Regional Director, basically to oversee, uh, serve the churches of Northern Ontario. And, and so that was a really hard decision for us. And so I moved to Northern Ontario. And, and um, my first my first job. I hadn't even actually left Waterdown at the time. I, I flew up north to, to deal with the church and, and I went to this Casey's restaurant. There was a conflictual situation going on. So I thought it would be best to meet in a neutral area. Nobody can fight in a restaurant really, right? So, so we're, we're there in this Casey's restaurant. I go in and, and I'm, I'm trying to get myself together because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, Lord, help me. And, and so before the meeting, I go into the washroom. Can't make this stuff up. There's a stream running in through the washroom, and I'm like, oh, I know how to fix that toilet. And there I am in a Casey's restaurant on my first day at the job. Okay, one more time. Fast forward the story. I get elected as superintendent this last year. And Pastor Lori moves out. Pastor Lori Gibbons, who went to be with Jesus, he moves out in uh, end of January last year, and and so I go to move into my new digs, and so I go to move into the office, and I'd been in the office a lot of times, but I realized I have my own washroom. Wow, this is amazing! <laughs> my own shower, like dreams are made of these things. And so, anyways, I move in, and and I I'm. In the first day that I'm in that office, I'm on a Zoom call, and shortly after I'd used the washroom, I hear the sound of a rushing stream, and I'm like, uh-oh, and you get it. Why do I tell you that crazy story? I think God's got a really funny sense of humor, number one. But it's a reminder to me, Jay, it doesn't matter what position you're in. Your first responsibility is to serve. Doesn't matter what role you're in, doesn't matter what position you're in, walk humbly and serve. I believe the reason that God used Elisha in amazing ways is because he chose to say, okay, I'm gonna be a servant and do whatever. This morning in this house, I don't know what God's calling you to. We're coming out of a pandemic season just like Elisha. And maybe you're like, okay, I'm set, ready to go. Like it's been a tough season. It's been, it's been a journey, but, but I'm, I'm ready to take the plow. I'm ready to go at a new thing. And just maybe, just maybe God's going to show up and say, okay, today's the day. Today's the day. And just maybe God's calling you to live life, life to the full. That, that, that God's calling you to, to engage in something that's outside of your comfort zone. You say, well, oh, maybe I'm not trained for that. Maybe uh, Elisha was a farmer and God used him as the greatest prophet. 
of all time next to Jesus. So don't limit yourself today, but instead say, God, what would you want to do through my life? God, if I surrender it, if I go full tilt, like push all the chips in and say, God, whatever you're calling me to do, I will do. I will guarantee you this one thing. Well, I'll guarantee you two things. Number one, it won't be easy. But number two, oh, it'll be so worth it. See, if you asked Elisha at the end of his days, Elisha, was it worth it? Like Elisha, you could have led a prosperous life as a farmer. You could have led just like a really good, stable life. Elisha, was it worth it? Oh, yeah, it was worth it. Every bit of it was worth it. I don't know what God's calling you to. Maybe some of you in the place, God's calling you to ministry. Maybe you're like, hey, I've been trained that way. That's, I, got a, I got a successful career. That doesn't stop God. <laughs> he just might be calling you to something today. Or maybe it's calling you to a ministry here. Maybe you've been sitting back waiting for Pastor Josh to, to ask you, but, but the Lord's like, no, no, no. Today's the day. I'm calling you to something. My dad always says to me, it's hard to steer a parked car. And maybe some of you just need to take that step and say, okay, God, what's it going to look like today? Life and life to the full. Amazing. Can we pray? Mighty God, just over this house. I say thank you for Kingsview. I say thank you for what you're doing in this place. I say thank you for students that are in the house. Lord, I celebrate these students. I bless them today, God. Lord, I pray over their lives that, God, you would take them in a direction, Lord, that they go full tilt in for you. God, that you would take them on such a wild journey that they never thought possible or imaginable, God. God, for those who are in the place and they, they feel like they're just kind of slugging it out day after day, God, today, would you just kind of show up like you did for Elisha that day? God, for those who are, are kind of one foot in and one foot out, that they, they, they know you've called them to something, but they're just kind of hedging their bets a little bit. God, I pray, God, today they would just say, God, I, I, I'm going to go all in for what you have in store. And maybe there's those who just don't know the dream that, that, that you've put in it for them, Lord. I pray today you would just kind of reveal that, Lord, that you would begin that process of life and life to the full over them. That when we put our, hand, our lives into your hand, you multiply it. Lord, your addition is tenfold. So God, for those who are in the house today and kind of going through that, God, would you speak to them that you want to live the more life through them, oh God, through Kingsview Church. Give them a courageous boldness, God, beyond what they thought possible, God. Oh, Lord. Just with heads bowed and eyes closed, just to give privacy, I promise I won't embarrass you, but I just felt there's somebody in the house that God's given you a mission and you've been maybe running from it a bit. Like God's spoken to you and you haven't burned the plowing equipment. Just with heads bowed and eyes closed, just to give privacy those in the house, if that's, if that's you today, just kind of look up at me and say, Jay, would you be praying for me? Yeah. You can put your head right back down again. Yeah. Lord, you see the ones. God, I just give them to you right now, Lord. May they be in your hands, in your name. Just as I go, here's what I'm going to ask of you. There's, I think some usher is going to give you these. It's simply just a little plus sign or a multiplication sign. Or if you're a ceramic tiler, a tile spacer. <laughs> but here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this and I'm giving you a little bit of homework. And students, you're like, homework, who's that guy? Crappy. Don't worry, Pastor Josh will be back or Pastor Jordan next, next week. But here's what I want you to do. Just for one week, if you, could you do this one week, seven days? Would you just kind of put this on your desk or put this on your kitchen table? 
Or maybe put it in your pocket. Maybe you want to put a hole in it, put it on your keys. But would you do this? Just every time you see it for the next seven days, pray, God, help me to say yes to your more plan that you have for my life. And I just, I guarantee you, as you do that, as you begin to pray that, God will just, he'll just show up in in pretty crazy ways. God, may your blessing rest on this Kingsview Church, God. May your blessing rest on the pastors of this church. Lord, I say thank you for them. Lord, for the Hagemans, Lord, for, for Pastor Stephen, for the entire team, God, we just, we bless them today. May your hand be upon them, God. And God, Lord, I pray, God, that we would be a people that just say yes to the more journey that you have for us. In your name, amen. Would you stand? Jason, home run. You just uh, hit everything that we've been walking through. I mean, that was basically the book of Romans in a nutshell. We can move on now, folks. We can move on now. This is amazing. Would you hold your hands out as we pronounce the blessing? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious toward you. And may he give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday fun day. Grab that token from the ushers on your way out, and we will see you next week. God bless.